I'd like to tell you about the strangest secret in the world. You go inside the cage. Cage goes in the water. You go in the water. Shark's in the water. Our shark. Farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. to sail back to Boston. So never more shall we see you again. <laughs> Listening to A Mind Revolution, leading you out of the rabbit hole, one grain of truth at a time. Hey there, everybody. PT Pop here with all four lobes of my brain securely bound behind my back. Welcome back to P.T. Papa Mind Revolution, where I lead you out of the rabbit hole one grain of truth at a time. It's been a while, my friends. It's been a while since I've released a podcast. Thank you to all of you who, who have remained faithful and continue to listen. I've got a lot going on here at home. I, uh, I've been working on a new podcast this podcast episode, but I've also been working on a documentary, a documentary about myself being raised by two alcoholic parents, and uh, it's been in production for the last year and like three months or something like that, and uh, it's been a very um, eye-opening experience. It's been a very sobering experience, no pun intended. And I have been uh, spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to make it because I'm doing it all by myself. And I'm doing it all by myself because it's such a personal topic and such a sensitive topic that I didn't really want to bring in a lot of other people, cameramen and sound crew and producers. And because I didn't really want to talk on camera about the things that I experienced in front of strangers. And that, and that also is not entirely true. I also did talk to two different producers, one in Hollywood, one here in Cleveland, and both said, dude, you're, you're nuts. Who's going to want to watch an autobiographical documentary about your drunken parents and your terrible childhood? And the one guy told me, you know, the only people that do that are famous. And I'll tell you what, you know, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing about the famous people and their tragic childhoods. I'm tired of hearing of John Lennon. You know, I'm a huge Beatles fan. If I hear one more time, one more time that John Lennon, oh, poor John Lennon, his dad, get, you know, left him when he was seven or something, and his mother got ran over by a drunken driver when he was 12. You know what? <clears throat> hold my beer, Mr. Lennon. You know, hold my beer. And, and, and the thing that really bugs me about this whole famous people is these people who we all idolize, myself included. At one time, I idolized John Lennon like he was Christ himself. These people wouldn't walk across the street to spit on us if we are laying and bleeding in the gutter. They wouldn't. They have no more concern about you and me until you're pulling the money out of your pocket to buy their records or to buy their movies or to buy their purses or their tennis shoes or go see them run around with a ball on a field. But this movie has taken a lot of my time, a lot of my energy, a lot of emotion has gone into it. And I wanted to make it not to just tell people of my story. It's not really about me. But there are millions and millions and millions of people in this country, just in the United States alone, who have suffered at the hands of drunken, and addicted parents, and even more so today than ever. And I think it's important an important topic to bring up because when you're in the situation and you're a child, you're told not to talk about it. 
it's meant to be a secret. It's meant to be kept a skeleton in the closet. And you're not to talk about it. You're not to utter a word about it because you don't want to bring, shine a bad light upon your parents. God forbid if anybody shone a bad light on the parents who abused you emotionally, mentally, and in some cases physically. God forbid if you, anybody knew what dirt bags your parents were. And for me, you know, my my parents both were addicted, but my dad's addiction to alcohol was as bad as a heroin addict. And I'm not I'm not making that up. That's just his addiction was that bad. It was terrible. And both of their drinking got so bad to the point where nothing mattered to either one of them but their next drink. Plain and simple. That's all that there was to it for them. And because of that, we were homeless. We were penniless. We were on food stamps. We lived in filth when we when we did have a home. And it, it really got bad, you know, um, as bad as most people get it. The one fortunate thing for myself is I wasn't physically abused by my father. Um, I wasn't molested that I can recall, though I wonder, I wonder if I was, for a variety of reasons that I'm going to today. But um, neither of my parents physically abused me, though I, I find out years and years later that a lot of the guys that I went to high school with, one in, one in particular, was severely abused. Every night when he went home by his dad, he was beaten severely by his drunken father. I didn't suffer that, fortunately. And the thing about this film, I think is important, there's so many people out there that have suffered at this, but they suffer in silence, and they suffer in silence because they're told they're supposed to suffer in silence, and I do not agree with that. You do not need to suffer anymore. And if I can tell my story and get some other people to tell their stories, that that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. So this hopefully will reach some people. And with those of you out there who listen to me, I know there's not many of you, but if you can tell people about my film, once I get it released, I'm hoping, I'm trying to finish it this month, start editing it in September and have it released in October or November. And I'm I'm not, I don't have any distribution channels. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm I'm not some big fancy film producer. I'm not Steven Spielberg. I'm Peter Tompkins from Cleveland, Ohio. I have a very tiny budget. I didn't. I spent a fortune on my first documentary. My first documentary was the artist of documentary. And I smell. I spent a small fortune on that film, and so far, maybe a thousand people have seen it worldwide. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm done trying to be whatever the entertainment world requires you to be to get recognized as a filmmaker. I'm not going to do it. I'm not spending that kind of money. If I've got the cameras and the microphones and the abilities that I have as a writer, I can do it. I'll do it myself. And if and if the Hollywood elites don't like it, screw the Hollywood elites. And if PBS doesn't want to show it, screw PBS. I'm going to distribute this. I'm going to put it myself, you know, on YouTube and BitChute and Vimeo and places like that. That's that's as, that's where it will sit. That's where it will be seen, and that's where it will die. So there you have it. That's what I've been up to. We've also got a very sick dog. I've got a dog, our dog, Eli, who is a Chow Chow, Border Collie, probably Labrador Retriever mix. He's been the love of my life, along with our dog, Zoe. But Eli, I rescued Eli from the Arizona Humane Society about 13 years ago when he was just like a year old, yeah, maybe a year and a half old. We're not certain how old he is, but... He is uh, coming in for a final landing, as it were. His final show is going to be pretty soon. He's very sick. He has hip dysplasia and arthritis, and we think a little bit of dementia, and he's in a lot of pain. But he kind of comes in and out of it. You know, He comes in and out of it, and sometimes he's kind of like the same dog. And then there's other times, most of the time he's not. Most of the time he's passed out on the floor because we've got him hopped up on all kinds of medication to try to ease his pain. And then unfortunately, my wife and I have to make a serious decision here. 
about his future and about putting him down. We're going to have to put him down pretty soon because he's just miserable and unhappy and in a lot of pain. And he doesn't always poop any morning, and when he does, it just falls out of his backside because he can't he can't squat to poop. And it's real sad. It's real sad because this dog, this dog saved me. When I uh, when I found him, and uh, I tell you, there's nothing like this dog. He's been an amazing, amazing dog. And I guess the one thing that makes it a little bit easier is that he has not been the same dog. He's not been a healthy dog for a long time. It's been at least a year. We've gradually watched him decline. So I'm hoping that when I finally do have to put him down, that it'll be somewhat easier because he's really not been the happy dog he once was for a while. So I've got a lot going on, and uh, I've been working on this new podcast. We're trying to write it, and hope it. hopefully it's a little bit more um, organized for each of you that listen. I do appreciate all of your, all, all of your um, listenership. For those of you out there, and since we last talked, and my, you know my last my last episode, I spoke with author Brian Tui about his book "The Fix Is In," and I really want to thank thank Brian for appearing on my show. I really appreciate it. Um, he was generous, asked nothing in return, other than to promote his book, and his book is fascinating. I since spoken to another author who I covered his book, I did a book review of his book, an author by the name of Tom O'Neill, who wrote, let me look it up, I can never remember the name of his book, because the title sucks. Um, it's like this, like, ten word title. Oh, it's it's Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the Sixties. Now, it's a good book. I give Mr. O'Neill this, but I asked Mr. O'Neill to be on my podcast, and the gentleman wanted $500 an hour just to speak with him. You know, I guess he thinks he's Truman Capote or something. I, I don't know, or he's Stephen King or something like that. 500 bucks an hour. I know hookers that charge less than that. Top top line hookers that charge less than that. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> but uh, Mr. O'Neill is not going to be on the podcast because I'm not about to pay him $500 an hour. And I think he does that to root out... I guess what he considers to be hacks like me. But his book is good. And he claims he, he has to charge that to get himself out of debt because it cost him tw- it took him 20 years to make to write the book, which is not my issue, you know. Um, but Brian Tui was a gentleman, and um, Brian Tui's book, The Fix is In, opened my eyes to something that I had been suspicious of for many years, that professional sports is fixed. Now, I'm not going to come out and say that that's exactly what his book says, but it pretty much says it in, in a roundabout way. There's, there's, he's, he's outlined beautifully in detail with facts to support that every single sport that we watch here in America, and in some cases the United Kingdom, is fixed either by the mob or it's fixed by drug, drug-addicted drug uh, players or it's fixed by gambling-addicted players. Points are shaved, games are fixed, refs are in on it, and it's all legal here in the United States because it's considered entertainment, and anything in the world of entertainment goes. You can do whatever you want in the world of entertainment, include lie, cheat, steal, beg. You just can't bribe. I guess you can't bribe players. So, Brian, thank you so much for being on my show. And um, I started my, my podcast several years ago when I had a terrible experience flying with, I think it was American Airlines, into Dallas. Uh, it was a Dallas, the Dallas airport. I can't remember what's even called now. But, but our, our flight got canceled because there was a thunderstorm and we all had to sleep on the floor of the airport that night. And It became clear to me that the airlines and the corporations in this country don't care about us. Now I'm finding out that the, the sports that I was, I was so into sports. This is long before uh, Brian Tui's book, but I started to really question sports. But I was a major, major Cleveland Browns fan, Cleveland Indians fan, and Cavaliers fan. 
But I always wondered how the Cavs, the Browns, the Indians could always be so bad. How could they always be like this, the redheaded stepchild of, of sports? And I always wondered, were, were games in the Cleveland Browns, like the drive and the fumble and all that stuff, were, were those fixed? Because I always wondered, how does, how does a field goal kicker, you know, just happen to miss something? How does, how does Jose Mesa, in, in closing out one of the most important games in Cleveland Indians history, just happen to have the worst game of his life? How, how does all this stuff just happen, happen to happen? Oh, it's just a sport, you know. But after I read Brian's book, I've seen how things are fixed, you know. And right now here in Cleveland, the Indians changed their names to the Guardians. And there's a big uproar here in town about it. Most of us feel like there's a whole different team in town. Even though it's the same players that were here last year, most of them, nobody cares about this team. I don't care about it. I don't like the name. But Cleveland never fields superstars. We haven't had superstars on our team since what the mid nineteen nineties when we had Kenny Lofton and Albert Bell and Manny Ramirez and uh I can't think of all those players. I can almost name the entire lineup <clears throat> if I had time to think about it. But most of the guys that play baseball in general today, whether it's on the Guardians or it's on the Yankees, most of these guys wouldn't even make the majors in the seventies. They'd all be considered minor league players. Most of the guys in the Indians couldn't hit a slider or a curveball to save their life. If you held a gun to their head and said, hey, hit this next curveball, their lives would be over. And and so I can't stand the Guardians because they just have a bunch of bums on the team. Now watch, you know, they, they right now what they're doing in this town is they've manipulated it so they, they're in first place for a couple of minutes. They're in first place in September, the first week of September. They're still in the first place. And all the people here that are paid by the networks to talk about the, the Guardians or say, hey, your your Guardians are in first place, everybody. The Guardians are in first place, man. They're on their way to the playoffs. And I know what's going to happen. They're going to stay up there. They're going to they're gonna hold their ground for a little bit. And maybe they'll make it in the playoffs. But the minute they start playing the really good teams, the people that can hit curveballs and the teams that can hit sliders, and the teams that don't have a million errors, they're going to completely disintegrate and fall and go by the wayside. But what they've done is they've tried to create a buzz around the Guardians. So the Clevelanders and the Cleveland former Indians fans will show an interest in the team. And that's what they're doing. It's been manipulated. I believe it's being manipulated. So somebody will show some interest in this team because they changed their name. And Cleveland, nobody goes to the games anymore. The the stadium is never as full as it used to be, especially for a first-place team. People don't care. No one's talking about it. Nobody wears Guardians jerseys around here. Nobody. Nobody does. It's a ridiculous name. It's a stupid name. <clears throat> so I think they're manipulating it. So they'll they'll get some buzz around the team, trying to get some support from the fans, from the networks, from the powers to be, to show some interest in them. They'll, they'll, they'll throw them a couple of bones in the playoffs, but they'll completely get annihilated. And by the powerhouse teams that make all the money for the networks. You know, it'll be the Yankees, or it'll be whoever it is. I don't even follow baseball as much as I, when I, I as I did when I was a kid. But <clears throat> so here we are. Today is September fifth, two thousand twenty-two. It's eight thirty-six p.m. on a Monday evening on a Labor Day weekend. I hope you all had a good Labor Day. We had rain here most of the weekend. The air show, the Cleveland air show, uh, was rained out two days in a row. The Indians game was postponed like four hours. Or, I'm sorry, the Guardians. Forgive me. The Guardians. Yay. That that game was almost rained out. I don't know if they won. I don't know. what. what let me look and see what happened to the Indians last night or the Guardians or whatever we call them. Guardians score yesterday. I'm on Google here. Oh, uh, they lost 6-3. to three. The Guardians are 68-64. And the thing, the thing, one thing, and before I go on with the rest of my show here, the thing I really dislike about the Guardians is I know their owner. I don't know him personally, but I I knew that the the previous owner, Paul Dolan, and I think he sold this, the team to his son. But Mr. Dolan, his father, is an attorney from my hometown of Chardon, Ohio. And I used to work in a restaurant on the square in Chardon, Ohio, which 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 was called Berkeley's on the Square, and I. 
was the host, and I, I, you know, I bust tables and I seated people and all that stuff. Well, Mr. Dolan was a fairly new attorney. Now, this is 30, oh, geez, this is 38 years ago, I think. Is that right? Something like that, 38 years ago. So it was almost 40 years ago. Let's say uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, it was 38 years ago, 1984. Thirty-seven years ago, something like that. <clears throat> Mr. Dolan, his father was was an attorney in town. He was a local attorney, and he would come into the restaurant and take over the extra room. We had the main restaurant, then we had an extra room in the back where he would come in with his entourage and take over and order dinner. and And, and we'd have to have two waitresses waiting on him. They'd come in with like fifteen people, and they were rude and mean and snotty, and they were lousy tippers. That's how I know they're cheap bastards, the, these people that own the Indians. They will not spend the money to get the good players. And even, even if they did, no one's going to give Cleveland a break anyway because we're a crappy little tiny town that makes no money for the networks or for Major League Baseball. But Mr. Nolan was a cheap fucker that would come in with his entourage, treat everybody like crap, leave the table a disgusting mess, and not tip the ladies that waited on him. Barely tip him. Terrible, cheap bastards. So, <clears throat> I've been uh, I've been real busy. I've been busy, and I'm I'm kind of bitter and angry tonight. I got a sick dog. I've also been trying to find a studio, I'm trying to find my own studio. I'm trying to move out of the house so I can go someplace and feel like I'm going to work, even though I really don't make much money at any of this. But I need to get out. I need to go someplace where I can just set everything up, especially my cameras. When I set them up here in the home, they get in the way. When I set up the lights and the cameras and the microphones, i got to tear them down at night because the dog and myself and my wife are tripping over them and it's a mess. So I thought, what if I had just one little room, a thousand square foot room, where I can set up my lights, my cameras, and my backdrops and just left it there and went home at night. And you think I'm trying to find, you know, a palace or something. There's nothing here in Cleveland. Um, and the places they do have here in Cleveland are in Jaghetto. Je- they're in really bad parts of town that I don't want to go to. I don't want to be accidentally shot by somebody who's in the middle of a gangland fight or get carjacked or something like that. So I decided to try to look in other cities. So I have a new studio in another city, but it's been really hard to get down there because there needs some, to be some work done on it by the uh, guy that runs the place, who's a run, wonderful guy, but the windows are broken. And, and uh, right now with this hot weather up in the – Mid nineties here in Ohio. I, I there's no air conditioning in this studio, and I can't I can't work in there. It's just too hot. So I got air conditioning, but it's a long story. I've been very busy, but um, well, if you're listening, which I assume you are, we have all survived the pandemic, haven't we? I don't know about you guys, but I still haven't been vaccinated. Not one of the vaccinations or any of the boosters. People in my family, my in-laws, have been begging me to get it because they they claim I'm going to get sick and die. So far, I haven't gotten sick at all. I, you know, we'll see what happens. Uncle Pooty invades Ukraine, and poof, poof, the Cerveza bug vanishes. Isn't that kind of funny how that works? I guess I'm just paranoid, though. Uncle Pooty invades Ukraine, and almost immediately, no one's talking about COVID anymore. And then they throw monkeypox at us, right? Monkeypox. Monkeypox. You're going to get monkeypox. Fear is a very powerful way of controlling the masses, people. Now, I think this is this is funny because they talk about monkeypox, and it occurred to me that people, your average human being on this planet, is so easily led to believe whatever they're told that I think if, if if the government or the governments of the world told people that monkeypox was a virus that made actual monkeys come out of your ass, people would believe it, and they'd be walking around putting corks in their backside so monkeys wouldn't come out of their asses. That's how stupid I think most people are. And we're, as, as, as a society, whether it's Eastern or Western society or live in the North Pole, most of us are pretty gullible. And fear is everywhere. I mean, fear is everywhere. And if you look at, like, uh, the landing page of, like, Yahoo, 
it's it's continual fear. It's just a constant avalanche of fear. You know, if, as I go to Yahoo right now, the landing site, the top headline says, jarring new detail, jarring new detail in Memphis jogger abduction. Next next story is country star sells shirts with Carlson insult. I don't even know what that means. Trump blasts Fox News, makes appeal to CNN. Fear scare, oh my God. Climbing group witnesses woman 900 foot plunge. Really? Oh. Chris Rock has choice words for Will Smith. Can somebody tell me why any of us care about Will Smith and Chris Rock? I don't know. There are some funny comedians out there, but Chris Rock is not one of them. And he says some pretty stupid stuff. But Will Smith... This guy goes up and insult, assaults another person on stage on live TV, and he's only banned for five years. I mean, the only, well, we all know why they didn't do worse to him. It's because he's black, and nobody wants to get sued for civil rights things. This guy is a dirtbag. They're all dirtbags. Steelers quarterback battles appears to have its winner. Well, that's kind of a good thing. I don't care about Steelers, though. I do care more about Steelers than I do the Browns. Then as you go down their front page, woman arrested at Las Vegas airport told officers it must be because she's so good looking. I mean, this this whole thing is just like the National Enquirer of the Internet. Next story down, estate planning strategies with $500,000 or more. Now estate implies death, implies one day you're going to die and leave your, leave your fortune to somebody. Courtney Cox rocks a black string bikini as she learns to drive a boat. My instructor was hot. What, who cares? Who's Courtney Cox? She, Courtney Cox hasn't done anything since she was on Friends. Was she on Friends? Is that that one crazy broad that was on Friends? Palin urges Begich, Betch I don't know, to drop house bid. Like, who cares? Ben Stiller and Sean Penn have been permanently banned from Russia. <laughs> what? So, so, so basically, they, they try to, to get you. They try to get you scared. Because fear is a very powerful thing. But they're using distractions right now. They're, they are now distracting us with CNN says the United States Navy confirms that UFOs are real. Oh no, UFOs are real. Hey mom, CNN and the Navy said UFOs are real. What do we do now? You know, um... UFO stands for unidentified flying object. Doesn't mean flying saucer. Doesn't mean green, little green men. Doesn't mean any of that at all. In any way, shape, or form. So, the Navy is just confirming the obvious that there are, in fact, objects in the sky that we don't know what they are. Boom. Plain and simple. That's all there is to it. But the average person goes, Oh my God, there must be aliens here in the sky. Get us. They're going to come get us and eat us at night. You know? And see, see, when I started this podcast, I wanted to inform people. I wanted to try to help inform people about how they're being manipulated every day of their lives by corporations, the media, and the government. Because most people are blind to it and choose to stay blind to it. And I, I was one of those people. I believed that 9-11 went down the way they said it went down. I believed that sports were real. I believed that all the rock bands that I listened to growing up as a kid were the rock bands that I grew up listening to as a kid. I believe they're all real musicians, and I believe they all played the instruments on the records. But but sometimes I, I second-guess myself, and I'm insecure, and I think, well, maybe I should leave the conspiracy theories to Joe Rogan, Alex Jones, Mike Williams, Russell Brand, London Real, and David Icke. You know, I mean, these are people that have done some heavy, heavy research, are known worldwide, and, and you know, the majority of us listen to them, believe what they say, for the most part. Some of the stuff that they see is a little bit, even for me, kind of out there. And But but when I bring up Brian Toohey's book, The Fix Is In, this was one of the final nails in the coffin for me where I no longer believe anything that I see. But But just recently... I've I've just finished reading a book 
which isn't a conspiracy theory book, but it's called Strange Love, a biography of Peter Sellers. And it's a biography covering the life of actor and comedian Peter Sellers. And if you're not familiar with his work, he was in the Pink Panther, the original Pink Panther, not the stanky thing that Steve Martin did. And everybody thought was genius. My God, Steve Martin. Whoever told you that that was good work <laughs> is so sycophantish. It's just so, your, your work in that film was just disgusting. It was horrible, putrid work. And, and to even try to copy or do what Peter Sellers did, you're, you're an idiot for trying. But as a kid, I was a huge Pink Panther fan. I was a huge Peter Sellers fan. And I was, you know, I'd watch movies like Pink Panther. And what else was he in? Um, Dr. Strangelove and um, the party and being there. and But when you're younger, you don't know the actor behind, the person behind the actor, you know. As a kid, when you see the Pink Panther, all you know is Peter Sellers is funny and, and you don't think about him much beyond that. Or anybody, anybody that's a rock star or an actress or a radio personality, you don't know what they're really like in real life. But as a grown man, my, you know, I begin to see things differently. You begin to realize that the, most of all, entertainers are nothing like their public persona. And in this book, Strange Love, a biography of Peter Sellers, and uh, who wrote this? I'll mention the guy's name. Strange, I forgot to put it in my notes. Oh, it's by um, Ed Sykoff. This is a book that depicts Mr. Sellers as an eccentric control freak with serious mommy issues. You know, it, it basically the book comes out and says he could be the, the most loving man one minute and in the next a raving violent lunatic. Jealous superstitious, he was fearful of the color purple, you know, he was into the occult and all this other stuff. And, you know, again, it 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 undermines the picture you have in your mind of what you think is real. Peter Sowell's this funny guy, yeah, he's a funny guy, and he's the clown for all of us, but behind the scenes, he was a tortured kid. When he was little, he was tortured as an adult. He was, you know... All kinds of things going on in this guy's psyche that that really made me realize this guy was really a tortured man. He was very he was filled with fear and anger and confusion and and he had a, he had a, a troubled childhood and his mother had some serious issues, control issues over Peter. And the bottom line I say here is not to make fun of Peter Sellers, but it's it's to point out that this man really had some issues. But everything that we see in Hollywood, and I use Hollywood as a general term for music and movies and TV, just entertainment in general, whether it's here in the United States or around the world, nothing is real in, in Hollywood. But on top of that book, I found another book by author David McGowan, which is called Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. And I haven't finished the book yet. I'm about 100 pages into it, so I'll do a full review of it once I'm finished reading it. But this book caught me off guard, honestly caught me off guard, because I grew up listening to not just the Beatles. You know, I listened to the Mamas and the Papas, Buffalo Springfield, James Taylor, the Monkees, all those bands from the West Coast. These are bands mostly from the West Coast. And this book, um, now if you're not familiar with with Laurel Canyon, Laurel Canyon, um, he just well, what Dave McGowan discusses the music scene that was born from Laurel Canyon, and Laurel Canyon is located in the mountainous neighborhood in the Hollywood Hills West, in the Hollywood Hills West district of Los Angeles, California, in the mid to late 1960s. Bands such as the Mamas and the Papas, Buffalo Springfield, the Monkees, the Beach Boys, and a whole slew of others lived, played in this rural era of California. And I grew up listening to all these bands. I, I didn't listen to Zappa, but Zappa came out of here, the Birds, um, a whole bunch of bands that I grew up just idolizing, just crazy about. Not, and I wasn't crazy about them as the Beatles, but I definitely knew their music and had their albums. And... 
the research done in this book leads the author to discover that many of the members of these bands, their managers, and other associates had ties to the military-industrial complex, political operatives, and intelligence personnel linked to the military and to the CIA. And it, it, the book illustrates how these bands were designed as a military CIA social engineering project to shape and reshape the minds of the youth. And as I'm reading this book, he point by point by point illustrates with complete factual detail of how these bands were manufactured and linked back to the military to undermine you know, the anti-war movement and a whole, a whole bunch of other things. And as I'm reading this, and if, if you want to know about um, Dave McGowan, he's got a couple of interviews on the on YouTube. Fascinating. But as I'm reading this book, I'm like, oh my God, Even these bands were all fake? And some of them were. I mean, he comes out and says that the birds, most of the people that played in the birds didn't even know how to play a musical instrument. And that the instrumentation in, in the studio was done by studio musicians. Now, I haven't gotten that deep into it yet, but that, that's what I heard him say in one of the one of the interviews. And this whole musical scene in Laurel Canyon, at the top of Laurel Canyon, or or in that vicinity, was a top secret military installation with a hundred thousand, fifty to hundred thousand square foot studios, where they made propaganda films to promote the military and the war, Vietnam War and CIA uh, exploitation operations. See, as, I, as I'm reading this book. I was thinking back to my childhood when I was in high school, and my friend Paul, and my friend Tim, and Mark, and Al, we would walk around our small town. And after school was over, and I went home and had dinner, Al would call me up and say, hey, Pete, you want to go walk around town? And I'd say, yeah. And he said, well, come down and meet me at Paul's house. And we'd go down to Paul's house, and his dad would say, well, you know, you don't want to go walking around town. You're just bebopping. You're out looking for the devil. And Paul would say, I'll screw you, Dad. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. And his dad would say, that music you guys listen to is all filled with the devil. It's all filled with bad messages. And, you know, we thought his dad was nuts. Oh, he's bebopping and the devil is everywhere. And we'd make fun of his dad and say, rip, the devil's in that bottle cap on the ground. Well, it turns out that my friend Paul, his dad, was probably right. Now, I don't know if I believe in a devil, so to speak, with horns and a pitchfork and a, and a forked tail and stuff like that. But now, all these years later, I think the man was correct. Maybe not the devil, as I said, with the pitchfork and horns, who sits in a subterranean l- layer of lava. But I think of the devil as someone who sits in an office paid by the CIA who is designed to make music to shape the minds of the youth, to distract them, to fill them with fear, to, in my case, get them to chase after dreams that aren't even achievable, keep them preoccupied with pie-in-the-sky BS. It's, It's more than apparent to me in any way that everything in the media is controlled by some nefarious force. It's designed to create fear, and, and if you don't step back and watch it, You'll never know. But tonight on the news, the, the top four stories were shootings and murders in Cleveland and in Akron, Ohio. I live in Cleveland. And one of the stories was about how, to cop, how a cop shot a 16-year-old boy in Akron. Oh, no. But the story says the boy allegedly pointed a gun at the cop. So this is all designed to make us hate the police again. They're going down this road in Cleveland. You know, then the other stories were about the, the 10 people that were stabbed to death in Saskatchewan, Canada, or something like that. What are they going to do now in Canada? They're going to ban knives. <laughs> they've banned guns. I think they've banned uh, assault rifles. Uh, I don't know. I don't know anything about Canada other than that. that uh, I can't remember his name. The guy that runs the place is a lunatic. Probably government controlled by some, some nefarious force. So. <sighs> The final thing that I discovered recently was a gentleman on the internet 
named Mike Williams. And Mike Williams has a channel on YouTube called Sage of Quay. And he's got a website, Sage of Quay. And um, it's Sage of Quay Radio with Mike Williams. And I'm happy to promote him. He spoke to me once on email, but I think he decided to stop corresponding with me for some reason. Um, but Mike Williams is a critical thinker and the host of popular internet site Sage of Quay Radio. He is uh, the founder of the alternative news blog Sage of Quay. Mike's content is dedicated to awakening the masses to help bring humanity back into our natural existence of living in truth and serving creation. Now I'm reading from his website. Go to sageofquay.com. You can find out more about him. <clears throat> Now, I ask you to listen to this guy's work. He's a musician. I consider him a philosopher of sorts. But he's also somebody that pushes the conspiracy, quote, conspiracy theory, unquote, that the Beatles are the first boy band, manufactured boy band, and Paul died in, Paul McCartney died in 1966. And if you watch this man's videos, You can see what he is saying, especially when it comes to the Beatles being the first manufactured boy band, is true. There's no other way around it. He, this man, Mike Williams, lays out fact by fact by fact between 1962 and 1966 that the Beatles were so busy with tours and photo shoots and press conferences there's no way they could have written like 150 songs and recorded six albums unless they were hopped up on speed and awake 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And he's proven to me, at the very least, that the Beatles are not playing on their own records. And this was, to me, as a, as a huge Beatles fan, Huge, because you, you've just got to look for him, talk about this on his, go to his YouTube page, his, his Sage of Quay Radio. And he released a video about, I think, five years ago or four years ago about how the Beatles, there's no way the Beatles played on their own records, their first six records. And I've always wondered about this. Now, when I was a real little kid, I was 12 years old, and the Beatles album Live the Star Club came out. And this is when the Beatles were playing Live the Star Club in Hamburg, Germany. And this is before they were famous. And I remember I couldn't wait to hear this album. It came out the same time as the Hollywood Bowl album came out, Beatles Live at the Hollywood Bowl. And I heard this record as a kid. Now, as you know, as a kid, it, your thoughts and your emotions are pretty much unfiltered. When I was 12 years old, I was a huge Beatle maniac, but when I heard this record, I didn't have anybody telling me this is good or this is bad or this sucks or this this is great. I heard it by myself in my bedroom on a stereo with no one else around, and when I started playing, I went, oh my God, this is terrible. And I don't mean the quality of the recording. I mean the guys playing in the band. Now, of course, maybe it's whoever recorded this had an off, you know, the band had an off night when they recorded it, but they're terrible. I mean, they're okay, but I, I always wondered, how, how did you go from this band in in some gritty, grimy German bar to just in a year and a half from that recording, go to, I want to hold your hand, she loves you, please, please me, polished, you know, charismatic, mega giants of rock and roll and pop. How? I mean, there's no way. And if you listen to this Mike Williams, he lines out the entire timeline of the Beatles' life that's been documented in all these books around the world. Their, their timeline from, from like 1962 until the uh, end of 66. And there's no way in the world that this band had the time to sit in the studio and record all these different albums and play on them and sing on them. And I've heard the Beatles' demos from the 60s, where it sounds like the Beatles are trying to 
put a song together, whether it's, you know, Can't Buy Me Love or Hard Day's Night, stuff like that. And it doesn't sound anything like the final product. Nothing. I mean, if you listen to the the attempted guitar solo by George Harrison in A Hard Day's Night in 1964, which is allegedly him trying to come up with a guitar solo, and the final product on the album, (laughs) it's two completely different guitar players, two completely different styles, two completely different takes. Like like the studio musician said, okay, George, let me take over here. I'll come up with some. There's no way George Harrison played that. If you listen to George Harrison play live, and I know a lot of people get pissed at this, but George Harrison is a mediocre or sub-mediocre lead guitar player. I don't care what band he was in. He his he's terrible. And when you hear him in these in these bootlegs, where were there outtake sessions of I Wanna Hold Your Hand or She Loves You or Can't Buy Me Love? You know, that is not George Harrison playing in the final take. So anyway, this this last few months has been a huge discovery of, for me to even think that the Beatles didn't play in their own records was was at first like a major kick in my balls because I, this is the band that I grew up idolizing, you know? And and I'm I hold nothing against Mike Williams. I think he's right. I think he's discovered discovered something that I don't think anybody else really discovered. Now, now to have studio musicians, what, what he's implying, or not what he's implying, he's coming out and saying, is that while the Beatles were on tour between 1963 and 1966, around the world, keep keep in mind, in North America, Europe, you know, Japan, that other guys were sitting in the studio writing their songs, somebody else wrote their songs, somebody else played the records, played, played the instrumentation, somebody else played bass, drums, and guitar. For the most part, the Beatles will come in when they were in between tours, like in between the North American and the European tour, and they would lay down the vocal tracks. They they do the lead vocals, do the harmonies, things like that. And there's a drummer named Purdy. Um, I can't remember his first name. B- Bernard Purdy. Bernard Purdy is a studio musician drummer, and he claims that he played on like 20 Beatle records as a drummer. Guys, you know, I, I don't want to harp on this. You know, I've been going now for almost an hour, and I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt because things are entertainment, anything goes. And if the Beatles had studio musicians doing all the instrumentation on their first six records, I'm just blown away by that. Now, I don't know about the whole Paul is Dead thing yet. I I do believe that something happened to Paul McCartney and John Lennon in the mid-60s because the Paul that I saw in 1966 and the Paul that I see in 1967 on Magical Mystery Tour and on Sgt. Pepper's doesn't look like the same Paul. That was in 1966. Looks completely different. And even John looks different. And I know they had body doubles, and I know they had people like that to, to, to distract the crowds and so they could make quick getaways and stuff. But the, the message of this tonight is nothing is real. I mean, nothing is real. If you're like me and you spent the first probably 41 years of your life, if you're that old, believing in an in, in what you saw in Hollywood movies and on TV and in the, in the news and the local news and in your sports teams, it's all bullshit. And it's all designed to do one thing, warp your mind and make money. And I, I'm shook up by this. I've not lost my mind. I mean, look up, look up Bernard Purdy. B-E-R-N-A-R-D, last name Purdy, P-U-R-D-I-E, and the Beatles. It's all over. It's all over the internet. And and there's nothing wrong with having studio musicians play on your records because I'm a musician, and I've, I've released five CDs. And 
all the instrumentation on my CDs, other than my singing, my acoustic guitar playing. You know, the bass is played by the guy that produced my CDs, Robert Carruthers. He played piano and lead guitar, and his brother played drums. And, you know, it's so it's it's a common thing. I, you know, I'm not a bass player. I can play bass. I can, I can fake my way through a bass line. I can play lead guitar, but I'm not comfortable doing it. I'm not a drummer. I could probably learn to play the drums. So this this is common. You know, I've heard like the the band Boston, you know, they basically recorded their first album, Boston, in their basement, and it sounded just as good as what they ended up releasing, but when the record studio hired them or, or, or made a contract with them and brought them in, they were told they had to re-record the whole thing, and I think they even brought in different musicians to re- record it. So, but But the myth of the Beatles is this. The myth is the Beatles are geniuses. The myth of the Beatles is they wrote all their own music. The myth of the Beatles is they all played their own instruments on the records. And this only makes sense because as you listen to the Beatles' music between 63 and 66, there's a certain sound in those years. But then when you get into 67, and 60, especially 1968 in a White Album, completely different, utter, utterly different music, you know, instrumentation. And it's it's a looser sound. It's a it's a sloppier sound. It's and I I hypothesize. I don't know if Mike Williams said this, but I hypothesize that you're actually hearing the real people, who are allegedly quote the Beatles unquote playing on the records. No longer studio musicians. I don't know if it's you know Fall or Paul playing. Um. But it sounds like the guys we heard in the cavern are actually playing on the White Album, Let It Be and Abbey Road. At least three of them, (laughs) if Paul really died in 66. And I I truly believe that the Beatles are a lie. And most of what we see and hear of them is an illusion. And that's, that's hard for me to say. That's really hard for me to say because I have been a Beatles fan since I was eight years old. So for... 48 years I've been a Beatles fan, a fanatic, mad, mad, crazy Beatle fanatic. I just found a letter that my dad wrote me from jail. He was in jail for a DUI, and he wrote to me and said, every time I hear a Beatles song, I think of you. Now, my dad was not a sentimental man. He barely ever spoke to me. But for him to say that means everybody who knew me, including my father, who was usually drunk half the time, or not half the time, probably three-quarters of the time I saw him, everybody knew I was into the Beatles. I was obsessed with them because they were my escape. They are the way I hid from the traumas of what I was seeing at home. I was going into denial through the Beatles. They were my fantasy world. And I, I, I truly believe that they did not play in their records. There's no way they could have, and there's no way they could have written 100 songs between 1963 and 1966 if they were on tour all the time. And in, you know, photo shoots and press conferences and everywhere. They were everywhere. There's no way they would have had time or the focus to do it. And I know this as an artist. I'm a songwriter. I'm a painter. I'm a filmmaker. You know, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. I'm whatever you want me to be. I'm a photographer. And I know if my concentration gets broken on a song it, and it's gone, I forget it. You know, I don't know. So I don't know who it is we see now when Paul's up on stage. I've seen Paul McCartney live three times. I saw Ringo once. I don't know who I saw live now, and I don't know who wrote these songs. And the point of this podcast is, again, I had had another podcast a couple of years ago called Nothing is Real, and uh, shit, I don't think anything's real anymore. The only thing that is real in this world is you and me. That's it. Not Michael Jordan, not LeBron James, not Peyton Manning, you know. Not the Sean Happy Endings Watson. None of those people mean anything. They're all propped up and paid for by nefarious forces that are out to take your money and out to take your minds. The only thing that's real is what you and I bring to each other. Love, empathy, respect, caring. It's so hard to find these days. And that's why I like being back in the Midwest. At least the people in the Midwest 
they seem to care about each other here in the Midwest. We seem to open doors for each other and say, please, and thank you. And if you bump into somebody in the grocery store, they say, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. You know, out west, when I was out in Cal- or, uh, Arizona and California, nobody gave a shit. They would run you over in the parking lot just so they could get home and smoke their dope. And the only thing we've got is each other. And I, I can't tell you what to do, but I am asking you to consider looking into the things that I have brought to your attention here in this podcast. Look up Dave McGowan's book. You know, look up this book, um, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. Look up Mike Williams' work on the internet, on Sage of Quay Radio. And I guarantee you, he's going to make you think, and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, mean the Beatles didn't play in their own records? They didn't write their own songs? The myth of the Beatles is much deeper than that, just what the media portrayed. The myth is a lie about them completely. And, and, uh, I, and if you really think about some of the music, you know, I, Ringo Starr's never come off and said he's a songwriter. But when you hear some of his stuff, when I watch him play live in his all-star band, I think there's a reason why there's another drummer playing alongside of him. It's not just for show. Maybe it's because he's not as hot as we all thought he was. I believe the Beatles, and I now believe the Beatles are the first boy band, manufactured boy band. <clears throat> and I'm not going to even talk about Tavistock. Tavistock is a whole thing I just discovered because of Mike Williams. I'd never heard of it before, but we'll, we'll cover that on another rainy day because it's rainy here. And I try to keep my podcast under an hour because I just spent two hours listening to a podcast by a comedian, Jim Brewer, where he was being interviewed by another couple other comedians. And they went on and on and on. And the headline said something like, you know, Jim Brewer talks about the evils of Hollywood. And they never talked about the evils of Hollywood. They never went into any major detail about it. So I spent two hours, you know, doing other things, but I'm, I'm listening and waiting and waiting and waiting. Like an hour goes by and they finally mention something for a couple of minutes, but they never really said anything about the evils of Hollywood. I'm like, I don't want to waste all your time with crap like that. But I'm serious, you know, uh, check out these, these guys work. Even um, Mr. O'Neill who wrote the, the book chaos and Charles Manson, um, Tom O'Neill, you know, chaos, Charles Manson, CIA. I mean, the book is only, you know, Hard copy is sixteen dollars. You can download the, I think you can download the uh, the digital version for seven or eight. You know he was nice enough to respond to me, but fi- Mr. O'Neill, five hundred bucks an hour. Come on, you know I'm you know you know I'm a schmuck. Okay, I'm a hack who's just got a microphone. But there was a time when you were the same thing, and yeah, you were working for some big magazine. But it's not my fault. You went thousands of dollars in debt. To, to follow this goof Manson around, and we all found out. We everybody knows now because of this guy's book and other research, including, including um, Dave McGowan, that Charles Manson was propped up by the CIA, along with Vito and what was it Vito and Carlos's hippie dancers. Oh my God! There's so many things in this book. It's all bullshit, <clears throat> and Charles Manson is nothing like you think he was, and he's not not exactly what history portrays him to be. I mean, he was and he wasn't. But there's a, reason, there's a reason why he was in the spot he was in, and it wasn't of his own doing. I think he was pushed or manipulated or put in that spot. Oh, man. So I uh, tell you what. Let me... Um, I'm going to sign off for today. I, w- I want to thank each and every for listening. But please check out these works and think about the things that you listen to in, in, in the media today, especially... Music. I, I don't listen to today's music, but the times that I do get a chance to cl- take a glimpse at the rap music and the stuff that's, you know, boom, the boom, the boom, the boom, the car next to me, the low rider that pulls up to me with the little skinny white kid with his baseball cap on backwards, boom, the boom, the boom, gotta get me some holes, boom, boom, the boom, gonna smack him over the floor, boom, the boom. Come on, guys, that's music. Come on, <laughs> it's angry, it's violent. Why do you think it's angry? Because they're trying to make young people hate the world. They're trying to make young people, especially the minorities, hate white people and hate and beating on their women and stuff like that. It's very, it's very, it's so obvious. 
Think about what you're listening to, the news, the national news, the local news. It's all manipulated and controlled. All of it is. And the only thing we have is each other. And if we don't start taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other, they're going to eliminate us. I'm P.T. Pop on a mind revolution, leading you out of the rabbit hole one grain of truth at a time. Take care. You have been listening to P.T. Pop, a mind revolution, leading you out of the rabbit hole one grain of truth at a time.